I grew up in a pub in the centre of Bristol at the end of the war. One wet grey afternoon, I opened a drawer in the bar and I found treasure. Film and radio stars, nature cars, kings and generals, all in glorious colours. So different from the drab post-war world I lived in. And then I found one of a man in old-fashioned football kit. And the name on the card, W. Wedlock, my grandfather. I was thrilled. I was hooked. They were cigarette cards given away with every packet. There were hundreds. What I didn't find out until much later was that these cards were designed and printed within a few yards, literally, of our pub. Marden, Son and Hall was the name of the firm. They were printers for the Imperial Tobacco Company. And they had 14 great big factories right here under the shadow of St Mary Record Church. We called them fag cards. My grandmother called them stiffeners. The early cigarette packets were very flimsy paper affairs. This is a very early example. And then they could easily get crushed. So somebody had the bright idea of getting a little piece of card and putting it down in the packet to stiffen it up. The first cards produced in the 1880s were printed with advertisements for the company. Competition was fierce and companies soon realised that a series of interesting pictures would attract smokers to their brand. The early series were on subjects like sporting personalities and pin-ups. This latter, beauties as they were known, caused an absolute outrage. Furious letters were written to the Times. The Bristol firm of WD and HO Wills was one of the biggest tobacco companies in the country and used a local printer to produce its cards. Martin Son and Hall began life in the early 1800s as a small engraving firm. In 1889, they won their first order for stiffeners from Wills. Business expanded rapidly, and just five years later, they moved into imposing premises here called the Caxton Works. At one time between the wars, there were over 50 artists, designers and researchers working on the top floor. One was Charles Sansom. Charles began working for Mardens on stiffeners in 1931. He specialised in flowers, watercolours and portrait painting. He trained at Exeter School of Art. decided halfway through my studies at Exeter that I was, I was going to be a commercial artist. I very much liked still life and life drawing which is, helps with one's portrait you see. I did a great number of wildflower series. I did some of the roses. Many portraits of film stars, jockeys, ra race horses. That was very exacting to get the, the right colour of the race horse. It's lovely to draw a chap with a sense of humour, I must say. <laughs> it's just my inability to take anything seriously. <laughs> <laughs> That's the other side of the coin, isn't it? <laughs> We did the kings and queens of England. Some of the portraits were in the National Portrait Gallery and I had to go up to check the colours to see if they were right with the originals. And it was approved by, by the royal family and it, indeed we were congratulated by the, the Lord Chamberlain. So I'm going to take a measurement here which shows me I've got to put some more hair on top. <laughs> I 
<laughs> well, nice, I'd so be uh, happy to oblige you with putting more hair on top. Right. Once you're satisfied, you've got right so far. Then you you can do the detail, which is the finished finishing touches, you might say, the detail. What were the working conditions like? They were they were exceptionally good. Each was we're sitting under a window, a window on our left side, you see, with the light going this way. It was uh, a very a very friendly atmosphere. It was a paternal atmosphere. Charles, you're going to sign that picture, but you never signed any of the pictures you did for cigarette cards. Now, no, why no. was that? No, no, we we weren't uh, allowed to sign our, our cards. But for a very good reason, because we we were only part of the uh, produ productive line, you might say. Can't wait to see that. What a splendidly twinkly, intelligent-looking bloke you've drawn there. <laughs> it almost looks like me. <laughs> Bristol produced many first-class artists who polished their skills on stiffness. They exhibited alongside some of the famous artists commissioned by Mardens to work on particular subjects. One of them was Eric Craddy, who did the Story of Navigation series. Another was a promising young painter who was entrusted with this series of wildfowl. He became very well known indeed. His name, Peter Scott. Cigarette cards became very popular. They were colourful, they were interesting, they were simply written and they were free everything that in fact the newspapers were not. Now the government soon realised an information potential here and when the Boer War broke out in 1899 they encouraged the companies to produce series depicting our heroes and updating people on events in distant southern Africa. At the end of the First World War, information had turned to blatant and sometimes crude propaganda. A series produced to celebrate the centenary of the Battle of Waterloo was actually withdrawn in case it upset the French who were now our allies. Shortage of paper stopped production of cards in 1917 and they didn't reappear again until 1922. When they did, people had had enough of military themes and in any case, they had other worries on their minds. More cheerful escapist subjects were introduced like flowers and stars of stage and screen. Collecting cards had become a popular hobby and a number of companies sprang up as dealers. One of them, the London Cigarette Card Company, started modestly in Chiswick and it became the biggest cigarette card dealer in the entire world. But to find it, I've had to come to this ordinary looking house in the quiet and pleasant west country town of Somerton. The company was actually founded um, in 1927 by a man called Colonel Bagnall and uh, it was in London for 50 years. We think we've got around about 100 million cards. Are they really worth a lot of money? Well, a lot of people get the wrong idea, Fred. Uh, a lot of uh, series from the 1920s and 30s were done in 600 million print runs. And uh, so there's a terrific lot of cards still about even today. Now, here's one that um, was produced in the late uh, 1890s and is in a metal frame. Now, I'd have thought that the, um, the card in the metal frame probably cost as much as the uh, cigarettes did. Here's something unusual. It's um, just a little folder, but inside you've got a flower and it's embroidered onto silk. The artist uh, of this series uh, made quite a gaffe because this picture is of uh, Benjamin Disraeli in 1826 
And in the background, we see we've got Big Ben. Well, of course, Big Ben wasn't uh, there in those days, so once the mistake was discovered, they tried to blot out the um, picture of Big Ben, but there's still just a little bit of it left on this one. See the shadow? And then finally, a completely new picture with no sign at all of Big Ben in the background. These are pictures of actresses from the 1890s on miniature cards, and then you turn them over and you find they are playing cards. Well, here's an interesting one, Fred. It's um, a little card, and on the other side, you've got a miniature gramophone record, which you could actually play. And this particular one is a interview with um, Eddie Hapgood, the Arsenal uh, left back. Only with his right or left foot automatically became a right or left back if he played in their defence as long pass. Modern football definitely demands a turn the last time of the defence, that is, apart from the goalkeeper, to be too... Frank, I've been treasuring this card of my granddad here. Now, what can you tell me about it? When was it made? Where did it come from? Oh, yes, W. Wedlock from um, Ogden's famous footballers. Now, that was a set that came out in um, 1908. I know this card's very important to me, but is it a valuable series? No, not especially. Um, you, get, you could get a complete set for about, um, about £70, something like that. With cigarette cards, a complete set. You've got like a mini encyclopedia, really, with, say, 50 pictures. Um, all the information on the back, um, and they reflect a particular period in time. So there's a great nostalgia with them as well. There have been a lot of cards uh, issued in the years after the war with uh, products like tea and uh, sweets and cereals. Now here's a, a, a set of cards which was produced within the last uh, couple of years. And although it's got a pre-war look to it, it is in fact uh, a very recent um, issue and um, is very popular indeed. The garage itself has changed very little over the years. Being close to home seemed like an excellent subject to use for one of the, uh, the motoring history cards. This is an illustration for um, cigar cards as they are now, sort of the uh, continuation of the cigarette card tradition I suppose one of a series um, on motor racing. So I see myself as carrying on that tradition um, to be commissioned to do a set of um, cards. It's 30 pieces of artwork and I think as opposed to in the old days where the subject itself filled the card, I think these days we think more of it in terms of a picture. It's not just in this case the racing car, it's the racing car in its environment. So I love the, uh, the nostalgic subjects and old transport and street scenes. I like to go back to the Victorian Edwardian times. There's a certain amount of fun and, and it's quite a challenge to try and create something that's not there anymore. By the 1930s, Bristol was producing superb quality cards by the million. You can see what a wonderful insight they were into the popular culture of the times. They even showed you how to play safely. Or if you preferred to know about your sporting heroes or screen and radio idols, it was all there, free. There's Stanley Matthews, well, he had a bit less hair when I saw him play. And this superb portrait of the Gloucester and England cricketer, Wally Hammond, is the original sketch in pen, brush and chalk for one of a series of 50 issued in 1934. The cards were read by millions. And what was written on the back had to be as accurate and concise as the picture on the front. Marden's kept a library of 80,000 books and a team of researchers. I was engaged in 1931 as a copywriter with a certain amount of knowledge of art to um, build up series of cigarette cards and also to write the text for the backs. Whenever we started a new series, we'd, we'd go out and buy all the relevant books on that particular subject. The tobacco companies used to um, give a 
a sort of an idea that they wanted a series possibly on transport or a series on sport or cinema stars and then they state that they didn't want this or they didn't want that but they wanted something entirely different what do you think of the millions and millions of cards that were printed it was amazing that the number of errors you could almost count on your hand i was responsible for one myself and that was in a series of household hints one of the subjects was cleaning a thermos flask if you get this clean river sand put it inside the thermos flask with some water and swirl it round. The thermos people, believe it or not, wrote a letter to Wills and objected strongly to Wills using their trade name without their permission. Well, everybody called it a thermos flask, but of course what it should have been was cleaning a vacuum flask. Vacuum. And that was altered on, so that anybody yeah. collecting that particular series would have to collect two cars. I think it was for number 43. I think my favourite series was a series that was issued to um, commemorate uh, the Silver Jubilee of King George V and Queen Mary. And it uh, depicted all the various important uh, episodes during the reign, finishing up with the portrait of the King and Queen at the end of the album. The following year, it was uh, the accession of King Edward VIII and it would be a, a wonderful series to produce at the time of the coronation. And everything had to be ready by a certain date. And of course, I had to come to the uh, re reference library and the newspaper library in particular and pick up photographs, pick out photographs of all the important events during the reign and also do write-ups about those particular episodes. And everything was ready and eventually Everything was passed by the Lord Chamberlain's office and um, plates were ordered for the printing. A few hours ago, I discharged my last duty as King and Emperor. You all know the reasons which have, have impelled me to renounce the throne. I have found it impossible to carry the heavy burden of responsibility and to discharge my duties as king as I would wish to do without the help and support of the woman I love. And of course the whole lot were pulped and destroyed. One day, a few years after the war, my gang and I were exploring a half-flooded cellar in one of the old ruined Marden's factories and we came across racks and racks of flat stones with designs on them. And also, a couple of rotted sacks of opaque glass marbles. Now, of course, we didn't know what the stones were about. All, all we knew was that we'd just become marble millionaires. But these stones were the ones on which the original cigarette cards were first printed. Now, it was a process called chromolithography, literally colour stone drawing. It was invented a couple of hundred years ago when somebody discovered that this type of stone would absorb a certain amount of moisture. They were prepared by rolling these glass marbles over them until they were smooth and grained. And then the reproduction artist took the actual size design and, and painstakingly copied it onto the stone. Furthermore, he did it in reverse. And then he made an exact copy for each color. And, and on some designs, that could be up to 15 colors. It was a very, very skillful job. Changes were being made all the time, and some of the later series were printed by a process called letterpress, which was very different. To explain that one, I'm fortunate to have an expert with me today, retired Marden's foreman printer, Charlie Watkins. Now, what's the difference then, Charlie, between letterpress and litho? Well, litho, as we've seen, is printed from a flat surface, but letterpress, from a raised image called type high, 980 thousandths of an inch, the diameter of an old shilling. The litho stones, uh, by virtue of their character, were limited in the number of runs which could be obtained from them. Letterpress lent itself to mass-produced methods. Once the originals were made, they could be easily duplicated, and the duplicates used uh, for multi-printing. 
The characteristic of Lytho is generally its richness and softness in its appearance. With letterpress, you get a much crisper look to the print by virtue of the fact that it's a raised image. Mm. Um, I've got one here, uh, a letterpress printed stiffener. Right. And, uh, well, have a look, Fred. Oh, okay. you'll, you'll so this is letterpress. Yeah, you'll note that the dots are... Oh, Lord, they've, got, <laughs> they've got hard edges and sort of um, yeah. soft middles to them. Now, look, I've got this card of, of my granddad's, 1907, this was, we've discovered. Now, yeah. So what process would that have been? Fatty wedlock. Mm. Well, that's, that's Lytho. That's Lytho, that is. Um, if we have a look at that, and you look at the, the dots, they're soft and irregular, nothing like the crispness of the letterpress. So this is what you call a letterpress machine then, Charlie. How did it work? A lovely old machine, a Wharfdale machine. There were probably well over a hundred of these machines used in Marden's for printing stiffeners in batteries of five to print black, yellow, red, blue images, and then, of course, the backs with the information on. Of course, nowadays, it would be, the machine would be covered with guards. Uh, old timers would have said, the more guards you've got, the less accessible the mechanisms are. But in those days, uh, very often, people would catch their fingers in the rollers and uh, remove them that way. Does this one work? Well, try it. Really? Try it. What yeah. do I do? If you go up there and press the yeah. green button, green one. Yeah. and pull the lever, off she goes. Oh, this one. Martins being Martins, uh, the standards were very high. Every Saturday morning, uh, when we'd knock off at 12.30, everything would stop at 11.30, and uh, every part of the machine was cleaned, ready for off to go next Monday morning. So all these old skills from 500 years ago, you might say, that were used in printing from letterpress, a craft which uh, was mechanized during the Industrial Revolution, a craft which had been harnessed for mass production. The end of the cigarette card story came suddenly and dramatically and it happened right here in the Temple Meads area of Bristol. In a way it was prophesied in August of 1938 when Marden's printed the longest run in the history of cigarette cards, 75 million copies. The subject, air raid precautions. On the night of November the 24th, 1940, the Luftwaffe rained high explosive and incendiary bombs down onto the centre of Bristol. Martins, by now producing maps and plans for the war effort, was a prime target. Printers and artists battled side by side through the night, fighting the fires. But when dawn broke, half the factories were destroyed, including the studio and the library. The era of the stiffener was over.